This is the chapter 15 lecture, Nutrition from Infancy to Adolescence. We're going to cover a lot of ground. As you might imagine, the diets of American children, like their parents, is quite poor. Low in the food groups which provide essential nutrients, high in the types of foods that provide substances that hurt our health. And this has led to chronic diseases in this very young population. Take a peek at some of the information on children in Philadelphia. This is my beloved health explorer. So you can drop down the menu and look at some of the data on our kids. When we look at the nutrition or when we assess the nutrition well-being of a child, one of the, the factors that we rely on is actually their growth, their height, their weight, their BMI. BMIs mean different things. So the number, for instance, you see here a 10-year-old boy with a BMI of 23 is actually obese. So the BMI numbers mean different things because they're based on percentiles. So it's a little bit different, but nonetheless, we are concerned about BMIs that indicate um, a lack of health. And the moving toward some of these chronic diseases. Now, if we want to take a look at the energy and protein needs of children, of course, there are graphs like this that give us a ballpark figure. But more importantly, and that's where I'm going to go back a slide, we do follow growth. We follow growth. We follow BMI. We look at health. We look at immunity, the immune, the strength of the immune system. And those things give us a better view than some cookie cutter approach. Let's start with infants. So we're looking at the first foods that are introduced besides breast milk or formula. And the current guidelines are between four and six months. More and more practitioners are, are saying six months. Wait till six months. Because early introduction of these first foods has been linked to an increased risk of a number of poor health outcomes. Read them here. When you see solid foods, that's the old term for fo first foods. So these pureed foods used to be called solid foods. Now, more often, first foods. There is a recommended um, kind of progression of foods. We used to adhere very strictly to First comes the cereals, then comes the vegetables, then comes the fruits, and that's lightened up a little bit. What guidelines are still being followed is that you should add foods one by one so you can note whether there's an allergy. You should absolutely um, meet the child's uh, developmental stage with the type of food. So you can see here, when they're ready to consume things from a spoon, of course, spoon feeding. When they start grabbing the spoon, let them try. When they're able to pick up finger foods, then put finger foods into the diet. So you meet their developmental ability with this progression as well. There's some good links to videos. Take note of those. I like this slide because it shows you the amounts that are required by an average child of that age. And it's much, much less than many parents think. One of the problems with the supersized generation is that we've gotten used to huge amounts of food and we expect little tiny people to be consuming these big platefuls as well. Also take note here that um, at 12 months of age, kind of the goalpost is that that child is eating regular foods with the family. Regular nutritious foods that might be chopped up, definitely in smaller portions, but there's no need for special pureed or toddler foods that you buy in a bottle after 12 months for most children. Here's some uh, little tidbits about infant feeding. Sweets you do not want to introduce early. Please look at these links. Honey is a risk because of botulism. We're going to look at juice. We have totally different guidelines around juice, and we'll look at that in the next few slides. And here is the point I just made. At one year, the same healthy foods as the rest of the family.
So these are the new guidelines because of our obesity epidemic and actually the access to so many different flavored uh, drinks and juices. This refers to real juice, good juice, like orange juice, okay, 100% orange juice, 100% apple juice. Those juices should be limited to a, an amount that's much less than many parents are giving their children. So you see here, for ages one to three, only a little half a cup about the same for four to six, and then for the older children, only a cup, only 100% fruit juice, put it in a cup, not in a bottle or sippy cup. And remember, too much juice provides a lot of sugar and calories, can crowd out other nutrients from the diet, and it doesn't have the fiber of whole fruit. Now, no juice before age one. WIC no longer covers infant juice for this reason take a look at these plates. And again, I love these menus. This gives you an idea of what an average three-year-old should be eating. And you see here all nutrient-dense foods in smaller portions. Snacks are important, but the snacks are things like whole wheat crackers and peanut butter and a little bit of milk. They're healthy snacks. All these foods are pretty nutrient-dense. And then this is for an eight-year-old. Some other uh, points around feeding children, it can be frustrating, they have preferences, they have quirks, and some of them are listed here. The worst thing to happen is to make mealtime a battle, to make mealtime a, a period of manipulation, either parent over child or child over parent. Remember, and this is kind of the golden rule about child nutrition, Children should be allowed to determine how much they will eat from a variety of healthy food choices. We want kids to pay attention to their own signals from their body regarding hunger and satiety. We don't want to raise another generation with the clean plate syndrome or rule. And lots of good articles and videos, so be sure to watch those. I mentioned avoid power struggles, keeping in mind that it often takes many exposures to develop a taste for a new food. Sometimes something smart to do is to put that new food on the table first before the comfort foods, the foods the child's comfortable with, and they might nibble away at it a little bit more. So I came across this. Um, years ago, but I've noticed more and more of it recently. And this is an interesting uh, phenomenon. Pediasure was originally designed for critically ill children, children who needed, you know, a full cord press to get some calories and nutrients in. If you've tasted Pediasure, it tastes like a milkshake. Kids love it. Well, now, Pediasure is marketing to families with healthy kids. Help kids grow, as if parents are doing their children a good thing by giving them this special drink. So take a look at the ingredients in Pediasure. Water, sugar, uh, and there's more sugar as we go down. But it's basically a very sweet drink. You're giving your little one a milkshake. And the problem with that is that you're training their taste buds to expect everything to be sweet. You're also crowding out their, their appetite. You're filling up their appetite with this calorie dense fluid so that they probably won't eat other foods. There are a lot of problems with Pediasure. Most dietitians are a little bit alarmed at its widespread use. More tips on feeding children, please read through them. I will tell you that there is actually a video, I believe it's right here, but look at both of these with a test question attached. So one of the problems with lots of sugar sweetened beverages is fatty liver disease. So be sure to look at these links. By cutting back on the sugar sweetened beverages, the fat in the liver decreases. 
healthy snacks are here a neat little video about some healthy snack ideas like most of us children like food that looks appetizing that is fun they love to dip they love to touch things with their fingers so there are a lot of ways to make snacks appetizing and nutritious take a peek and finally i love this um this set of guidelines, 5210. A little bit of information about it is right here. If we could use this as a tool to teach parents, I think it would be helpful because we found that our kids are not getting the fruits and vegetables they need, are getting far too much computer screen time, are not getting the physical activity they need and are drinking far too many sugary drinks. So five, two, one, and zero helps parents remember these rules. Be sure to read through the section on malnutrition. We have horrible numbers as far as poverty and food insecurity in children in this country. It's much more common than we would like to believe or should occur in a country as wealthy as ours. There are both short-term and long-term health and behavioral uh, results from this for sure. And we have a video linked up here. Now, of course, we have uh, federal programs that were originally designed to provide required nutrition to children and for those at lower income levels at a reduced cost or free. But there's a lot of controversy about um, school lunches as well. So much controversy. And you can, we're not going to do the three minute paper, but this actually shows you a link about how the school lunch has got, gotten tied up uh, with big food corporations. And it's gotten away from what might have been a, a very good goal or mission. Uh, so look at that and think about the school lunch program for sure. As far as other concerns around nutrition, one is hyperactivity and its relationship to diet. I have a couple of, of interesting links here. We have found that children who have diagnosed attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, there is some research to show that their behavior is better with fewer food colorings in their diet. So take a listen to that. And we're also starting to realize, and I love this, I'm so glad that these children also do better if they get enough sleep, eat properly, and don't get too much screen time. So take a look at this as well. I think that's really important as you talk to parents. Physical activity is important for all children. If you have children, you know how Burning off steam improves their behavior, allows them to function better. For goodness sakes, it does so for adults, right? So kids need to exercise and they need to get plenty of um, age appropriate exercise. 60 minutes a day, read through these guidelines. A bunch of different links up here. Hope you're visiting these pages. Now, as far as adolescence, this is a short period with dramatic changes in terms of body composition, in terms of height, in terms of weight. And for the first time, nutritional needs of males and females differ because of different body compositions, menstruation in females, etc. Nutrient needs are very, very high, but should come from the healthy food groups and it's a crazy complex period where there's a lot going on. One of the things that tends to happen in parents of adolescents is they don't know what control they have over their teen's diet, but they still have some, and that's really important to understand. They are still the gatekeepers for a good amount of the food that the, the child is eating. So here are some nutrients that tend to be nutrients of concern. A great article here, please read this. What comes out of this article is we need to talk to our teens about nutrition in terms of things that they are interested or value. 
and that if we provide easy to eat nutritious foods, they are more likely to eat nutritious foods. There you go with that. And finally, our last topic, and this really covers children and teens, is childhood obesity. Very, very important topic because we are not uh, bringing the curve down in any significant way. The only age groups that are seeing maybe a plateauing or a little bit of drop in obesity are the very, very young. The other age groups were actually seeing an increase, especially in the severe obesity. So the statistics are staggering and heartbreaking because these are kids. We've talked about energy balance. We understand this is a multifactorial problem, but a lot of it is as simple as, not simple as well, because social determinants come into play, but kids are eating more more calories, more sugar, more fat, they're not moving as much. And the environment that surrounds them is conducive to overeating and sedentary activities. Now, the horror of this is the impact this has on the health of this child. Take a minute, stop the video to look through all of the different complications that can occur. Orthopedic complications liver disease, diabetes, with a very rapid increase seen from 2000 to 2008. This one boggles my mind. Remember too that diabetes doesn't typically come alone, okay? It comes with a constellation of disorders and you see that here. This is a sign of insulin resistance, which is a sign of prediabetes or diabetes. So when you see that darkening of the skin and kind of the change in texture in the groin, armpits, and neck, uh, most practitioners will send immediately for a blood sugar test. High cholesterol, hypertension, these are things that shouldn't happen in kids. When we talk about obesity, it's very easy to start wagging a finger and pointing that finger at parents. So I, I got this from a conference on childhood obesity, but I want to explain this because I did work with parents of very obese children um, for a program at my local YMCA for a number of years. And I, bet I met some of the nicest, most concerned parents that I've ever met. Most of them were amazing. So let me explain to you how this is sneaking up on parents, how this occurs. And, you know, this is just one little scenario, but take a listen. You've got a healthy child, and she's not only healthy, she's amazing, never causes a problem, loves to play quietly with her dolls or her video games, and is great because then you um, can just leave her and to be play and she's perfectly happy. But what happens then with that low activity level is the energy balance becomes in, imbalanced. And then you have this mildly obese child and something kicks in and you think, ah, oh, is this a problem? But parents and family and friends tell you, um, no, she's adorable. She'll grow out of it and she gets more obese. And at this point, maybe you start to push her out the door to go play and run with the kids, but she's not comfortable doing that. She's out of shape, she's a little uncoordinated, and so she comes right back in to sit and play dolls or with video games. And now you know you have a problem, but you don't wanna penalize or stigmatize your child. Um, but what do you do? You know, where do you go for help? And that's how sneaky it is and that's how it happens. Now, I also want to say if we're pointing a finger at parents, we should also point a finger at practitioners because what point do you think the parents and the child should get the talk about activity and a good healthy diet and, and kind of uh, getting things into shape uh, as far as weight, most of my students, when we're together, say, 
second or third, right here. Some say all children should get that talk. Then I ask, when does it happen? Late in the game. So because pediatricians and nurse practitioners are sometimes uncomfortable talking about this to parents because they're rushed, because a child might be generally healthy, we don't jump on board immediately. So that's a concern. And I have a little link here, okay, about um, how obesity should be defined and addressed in children. Okay, so I'm going to leave this actually for our discussion, and that's it for that lecture.